Thank you very much. I'd like to thank, uh, before I start, the organizers of uh, this uh, very, very stimulating, engaging, instructive uh, conference, workshop, and to thank also the participants and the audience in this very last day. Uh, one last thing that could not have been, I could, could not have been mentioned is that I came to this topic after studying and writing extensively on Jewish conversions to Christianity during the Holocaust. In 2017, just a short while ago, a group of elderly Jewish women stepped out to recount sexual abuses they experienced, experienced during the Holocaust years. This was a landmark, an outcome of a process by which Holocaust survivors felt more reassured than before that they could come forward and testify the fullness of their experiences. This, I would claim, was far from being the case in the immediate years following World War II and for decades to come, when survivors were reluctant to recount, let alone write about, topics which were taboo and that society at the time refused to discuss openly. Very few dared bring up the subject in the 1940s to the 1960s, the Polish-Israeli author Katsetnik 135633 published a series of books depicting sexual exploitations as well as, as well as other extreme experiences that individuals encountered during their internment in ghettos and camps, but on which they were mostly unwilling to report. However, the Israeli and Jewish literary establishment did not embrace Katsetnik's novels, Many consider them perverse, beyond the pale of respectable literature, similar to the semi-pornographic Stalag series that appeared in Israel in the 1960s, depicting fantasy sexual encounters in prison war camps. The controversial author was possibly the first Holocaust survivors who dared to publish blunt description, even if in a fictional form bordering on fantasy, of sexual abuses the Jews under Nazi rule encountered. This paper wishes to consider the reasons that Holocaust survivors did not allow themselves to be open and straightforward about a major dimension of the experience that they, they had undergone. It further aims to explore the evolvement of more complete testimonies since the 1980s and consider the development that made them possible. I believe that contrary to the conventional assertion of testimony, reco testimony recorders, Holocaust testimonies are not necessarily more reliable or complete when given in proximity to the events. We have here Professor uh, Chagit Lavsky, the illustrious Professor Chagit Lavsky, whom I looked up to when we were both working at the Institute of Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University. And it was like a dictum, like a motto of the Institute. The more immediate the testimonies, the more reliable and complete they are. And I have told Professor Lovsky, it took me a while, but I totally stand against it today. In spite of my love and admiration to our mutual Institute. Published a collection of Holocaust survivors had therefore undergone huge transformation between the post-war years and the turn of the 21st century, mostly in response to the mega changes in values and morals between the 1950s and the 1980s. Reporting on sexual encounters, especially in first person, in autobiographical accounts, has become legitimate in response to a series of liberation movements that have altered the social convention in which the survivors have come to live their lives. Testimonies in the sexual realm connects, therefore, to larger themes that are not necessarily limited to Holocaust survivors. Changes in attitudes have allowed many groups of women, and men too, to offer fuller testimonies that include sexual encounters and abuses. Still, sensitivities surrounding the Holocaust have made discussions of such testimonies more difficult, especially because many, I would say perhaps many still, or many, not, or many, have viewed the Holocaust as sui generis and its victims as unique. 
This paper takes a comparative outlook, acknowledging the similarities between Holocaust victims and other women and men, and men in liberated Europe who opted to conceal sexual degradations. Likewise, it will look at movements that have helped alter Holocaust testimonies. Among them, the sexual revolution of the 1960s, 1970s, that made discussions of sexual topics more open and legitimate. The women movement that came about in the 1960s, 70s, and followed since then, and urged women to bravely report sexual attacks and exploitations. And, let's not forget, the gay liberation movement of the 1980s, 2000s, that helped to legitimize open discussion on LGBTQI issues and experiences. As times and circumstances would not allow them otherwise, testimonies of survivors tended to conceal sexual aspects of their life during the Holocaust years. Autobiographical accounts cater to the expectations of the audiences that they are commissioned to inform. All writers in the decades after the war abided by early 20th century middle class norms of propriety, which dictated self-censoring and refraining from exposing intimate moments. The survivor had also to consider the wish to rehabilitate themselves in this, what we would call petit bourgeois atmosphere, connect with new partners, marry, build families, and find a niche in respectable society. The stigma was such that most Me Too victims of the period calculated that refraining from complaint and even comment was the best policy. Holocaust survivors are not the only ones during the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and even 70s to refrain from including information on vulnerable sexual experiences in their testimonies. The subject was mostly taboo, and members of other groups too came out only decades later to tell their stories. Women in Korea and Indonesia under Japanese occupation come to mind. So do German women in Berlin during the Russian invasion. In 1959, when Martha Hillers published A Woman in Berlin, readers in West Germany were scandalized and condemned condemned the narrative. 44 years later, the book was well received and translated to numerous languages, including Hebrew. Perhaps not surprisingly, the journalist who wished to reveal the topic of rape, rape published her memoirs anonymously. In the documentary Stalags, Ruth Bondi, of very blessed memory, offered a number, another explanation to the silence. The struggle to survive trumped all other considerations, and many Jewish women have prioritized their goals. Viewing sexual abuses, feeling about the sexual abuses, as secondary to the major mission of remaining in life. Those among us who had undergone incarceration, torture, exposure, and hunger can appreciate Bondi's remarks. However, the belated memoirs and narratives suggest a somewhat different reality, because the anger and anguish is there. The pain, humiliation, and anger were there under the surface for long decades, affecting the victims' lives, seemingly repressed, but ready to come out when time was right. And the changing time proved indeed, providing, have provided an opportunity. The sexual revolution of the 1960s-70s allowed more space to discuss sexual experiences openly in public sphere. Autobiographical accounts of different sorts began to include more intimate details than before. An explicit depiction of sexual encounters began to appear in literature, media, movies, music, popular culture, and art. The women's movement gained more ground, ground in the following decades, further influencing attitudes towards recounting of sexual abuses of both women and men. 
Many of its spokespersons encourage women to step forward, overcome embarrassment, and report their experiences, reassuring women that what they had gone through carried neither stigma nor guilt. The cultural changes and a new public discourse has also raised more awareness to possible sexual abuses during the Holocaust period. Holocaust memoirs could now begin to offer fuller and more honest sharing of personal histories. The first waves of autobiographies that openly discussed sexual abuses came out in the 1980s. The authors, mostly educated professional women and men, now felt that they were ready to speak, had the right to do so, and could find platforms to recount the full, ex the full experiences they had encountered. Between the 1980s and the 2010s, hundreds of biographies have come out that discuss openly sexual encounters that merely, merely a few years earlier, both authors and audiences would have considered inappropriate and unwise to discuss. The Me Too campaign of 2017 removed some of the last inhibitions that stood against women fully sharing their experiences. Quite strikingly, during the campaign, a group of elderly female Jewish women of Eastern European background, ladies who previously would have died rather than expose themselves, came forward together. Now, more than 70 years after the end of World War II, they finally, finally found the courage and legitimacy to discuss their past reviles freely and trusted that there were audiences out there that were willing to listen and understand. Still, even three quarters of a century after the event, the topic is not easy to confront. In addition to the recounting of vulnerability and pain, the sensitivity surrounding the Holocaust, and the aura of martyrdom and bravery that many audiences ascribe to them make it difficult to bring sex into the picture. Testimonies reveal sexual abuses of every sort and category ranging over long years. Nazi intrusion on Jewish sexual life started already before the war years with laws attempting to crack down on intimacy between Jews and non-Jews, and continued under many guises during the war years and beyond. Those who survived the Nazis continue into the post-year period to encounter exploitations and uncalled for intimacies on their immigration routes and roads to respectable citizens. Perhaps not surprisingly, there have been hierarchies of willingness to share and conceal. Survivors and audiences considered some forms of sexual exposure and abuse as legitimate information. Vulnerability and invasion of women's and men's privacy, autonomy, and ownership of their bodies were routine. Prisoners had to strip in front of guards, including those of the opposite sex, as well, in front, as well as in front of each other. Survivor gave evidence to this aspect of life in concentration camps, work camps, and prisons after release offhandedly. By the standards of the time, there was no major violation involved in stripping and exposing prisoners, and survivors felt confident to describe these procedures openly. Nazis and others used body exposure including intimate exposure as a form of torture, especially during cold weather. This too was no secret, and survivor report, survivors reported on that openly. Care, camp authorities often enforced the, the removal of body hair from men and women, including in private parts. This information too came out rather early. Women and men too compl complained quite openly about the camp's deprive depriving them to the extreme of any sense of femininity or masculinity. They lost their hair, clothing, and individuality, and had no ac access to personal items that could offer comfort, relaxation, or sense of individuality. Relatively early on in the post-war era, the public also learned about the Nazi medical experiments, which involved invasions of prisoners' bodies and damaging of their health. Among other venues, prosecutors included such evidence in the first trials already of Nazi war criminals. 
Many of those procedures involve sexual and reproductive organs, at times maiming or sterilizing prisoners for life. In spite of this ch chapter in Nazi imprisonment being public knowledge, most survivor, even survivors, even in this case, would not report happily on such aspects, at least not immediately. It could hinder their chances of finding partner, establishing families. Still, perhaps because Nazi doctors conducting those procedures under the guise of medicine, conducted those procedures under the guise of medicine, and because they did not ask the women involved to give themselves in sexually, inmates reported on these chapters in their life more readily than those involved in other forms of sexual abuse, bartering sex for food or shelter, and submitting seemingly freely to sexual interactions with Germans carried greater stigma. Some of the most difficult experience to reports were those involving rape. Men had been even more reluctant than women to reveal such moments. Admitting to such occurrences in the past would have put a question mark on their masculinity and would mark them as weaklings, effeminate, effeminate or victims in the extreme. In the war and post war macho culture of the late 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, male Holocaust survivors struggled to prove their virility, and if arriving in Israel, joined the ethos of the mythical Israeli strongman. Perhaps the first to publish his recollection of his rape in Auschwitz was the author and journalist Roman Frister. The Polish-Israeli writer offered a graphic depiction of the event, At the same time that he was careful to contextualize it within the realities of hierarchies and submissions in Auschwitz. His testimony provided information on aspects of internment that the public had not been privy to before. Granted, Frister opened up four decades after the war ended. Still, few were as courageously outright as him. It is not a coincidence that Frister spends much of his autobiography exploring his post-Holocaust sexual conquests in bravado and macho terms, complete with his feathering of a number of children with multiple women in a relatively short period of time. His record as a Polish-Jewish Casanova nourished his frankness. No one could cast doubt on his credential as a top-notch John Juan. Aaron Appelfeld was no Casanova. He began writing on the Holocaust in the 1960s, but only in an autobiography published towards the year 2000, he revealed elements that related to sexual abuse <coughs> during his Holocaust years. He found himself as a child, an agent pimp in the home of a prostitute. He offers much more. Children and youth found that their own survival depended at times on joining and aligning themselves with members of the underworld in various parts of Nazi-occupied Europe. And the shelter came at a price. Abuse and exploitation, he informs us, has not ended with the Nazi defeat. And the safety of young men was still very precarious. Apfelfeld goes as far as to claim that sexual abuse was so ubiquitous that in the 1950s, as a student at the Hebrew University, he could identify by observing the expressions of male Holocaust survivors who among them were subject to such abuse. Appelfeld, a prolific author who published numerous books, had to wait half a century, more than half a century, in order to provide a testimony about sexual abuse, only small part of which in first person. Until the 1980s, offering testimony on sexual encounters between Jews and non-Jews in which survivors had a measure of agency was also beyond the pale. It could compromise both the personal reputations of the individuals and the collective image of Jewish behavior during the Holocaust years. In spite of Nazi laws and bans on intimate encounters between Jews and non-Jews and the draconian repercussions <coughs> 
sexual interactions were rampant. In jail, these Jews were not alone. There were, for example, laws and regulations attempting to curtail relationships between German women and prisoners of war or forced laborers. And still, non-Jewish memoirs relate to such forbidden intimate encounters. Reporting on such experiences in the immediate days after the war was, ex was dangerous. Many citizens in post-war Europe, East and West, directed their resentment towards women who conducted affairs with the enemy. Few at that time thought of such sexual encounters as a means of survival or as conducted under abnormal circumstances and uneven exchanges of power. Jewish and non-Jewish women were careful not to reveal they had given themselves to representatives of Nazi and other regimes associated with the Nazis. Some, like Viera Gren, could not avoid attention. Gren's story is rather daring. One of her intimate moments with a German took place in Auschwitz. Gren did not, Gren did not complain about the officer, but about her fellow Jews, how her fellow Jews accused her of collaboration. She reports the courts to clear her name in Poland in the late 1940s, incidentally successfully, and again in Israel in the early 1980s. A huge gray area revealed itself in belated autobiographical accounts. Anyone familiar with testimonies of survivors who described their lives in ghettos, war camps, or concentration camps will grasp the strikingly different atmosphere that prevails in memoirs of survival who hide in Berlin, Frankfurt, Vienna, in other such cities. The accounts offer a strong sense that although the writers laid a dangerous undergraduate, undergraduate life, they had greater agency and a sense of control of their movements. Most of them recount sexual encounters, with many bartering at times sexual favors for food and shelter. However, they also describe romances and falling in love. Such recollections were complete taboo in the post-war years. Some relationships were illicit twice over. The, perhaps the most famous today among them was the story of Aimee and Jaguar. If some people here know it. In this case, as well as others of its kind, another liberation movement played a part, namely the LGBTQI. No gay Holocaust memoir could have possibly appeared before the 1990s. Such open testimonies appear to great acclaim at the turn of the 21st century. Not only Jews, but others as well provided Me Too gay revelations, including in a striking documentary, which I'm sure many have seen, Article 175. Gad Beck, Gad Beck appeared in the uh, Eichmann trial, I won't introduce him elaborately, has offered glimpses of gay Jewish underground life during the Holocaust. Beck and others made it clear that the genuine romances they encountered did not hinder constant bartering of gay sex in exchange for assistance, shelter, or silence. Incidentally, because Beck was in a leading position, found himself suddenly a leader of a Zionist youth group, if you will, in Berlin during the war, he bartered such favors not for himself necessarily, but for the sake of finding shelters, documentation, food, medicine for others as well. Gut Beck and others, gay and straight, have made the claim that the sense of danger incited or enhanced the need to live the moment to its fullness and make the most of opportunities to love. The belated publishing of testimony that burst with adrenaline and testosterone should not be surprising. They are an outcome of our times, an era of sexual uninhibited freedom that allows and even welcomes such narratives. While their evidence relates to three quarters of a century ago, they testify to the values and freedom of the last quarter of a century. Thank you very much for bearing with me.